Amen. 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 Well, good morning again. (laughs) Hey, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians in just a moment, but I, man, I, I, I'm more convinced than ever um, that the power of God is real. I've been convinced of it my whole Christian life, but I'm convinced more than ever that that we have barely scratched the surface of what God intends for our lives. Would you agree with me? And, and how we get there, um, sometimes we, we pursue things on our own end, but, but really um, to take certain risks, to trust and believe that why not today? Like why not right now? Why, would not, why wouldn't God want to heal somebody right now? Why wouldn't God want to change our mind about something? Why wouldn't God want to illuminate uh, a, a, an idea that we've had through his word? Why not today? And, and so it's with that heart that I'm excited to bring God's word to you this morning. And I hope that you're excited to hear it. Um, last week we were in the book of Acts and Acts will always mess you up, right? It's just so good to read Acts because it's just right there and you either have to take it as literal history or you have to explain it away. And I choose not to explain it away. I choose to look at it and read and go, why not? Why not? And my, my hope today is as we open up God's word that you'll cultivate a, a heart attitude of why not? Like why not in, in your life today? Why not God um, to touch your heart and your life and, and maybe change a perspective? And as we read the book of Acts, and or not we didn't read the whole book, uh, but we read chapter 8 and we looked at this guy named Philip as he came to a place called Samaria that wasn't the most popular place to do ministry. It was a place that was avoided. Um, it was a place that there, were, there was cultural tensions between Jewish folk and the Samaritans and and yet God through uh, circumstances that were not something that that anyone would enjoy it was through persecution that it caused a scattering and sometimes God uses circumstances to get us where we need to be amen sometimes there's stuff that goes on in our lives that pushes us into a place where we need to be that maybe we wouldn't go on our own and so this is where Philip finds himself and and I'm not going to re-preach the whole sermon I'm very tempted to do that it's just something that automatically starts to come out but but what what I captured from that time and I hope that maybe you walked away from is that Philip didn't just go to a place called Samaria, Samaria and talk about Jesus it says that Philip went to a place and proclaimed Christ he proclaimed Christ he spoke as a as a a spokesman or as one with authority the name of Jesus over a region and over a place and as a result there were three things that I read that happened and you might remember these things one people were delivered from evil spirits right that there was true demonic oppression that people were were dramatically delivered it says that there were even shrieks of evil and and so those or (laughs) I kept doing that there were shrieks and with the shrieks the evil spirits came out but but regardless of how it all went down stuff went down right so that there was there was deliverance that occurred. It says that there was physical healings that took place. And, and that, that means that that said the paralytics were, were walking and so forth. And the third thing that, that occurred as a result of the proclamation, not just talking about, but declaring, proclaiming Jesus, his real power, his real presence, his real kingdom taking root in a real point in history. What occurred was the restoration of joy. And, and, and my observation is that oftentimes we are faced with a, a joyless um, culture, a joyless society, and yet the people of God can be filled with joy as a result of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I just say amen every once in a while to make sure, you know, we got the feedback stream going. So, so at, any, at any rate, um, I want to springboard off of that and I want to share with you something that, that you've probably heard before, but yet I think we need to be reminded as the people of God and, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and, and what I want to talk to you about in Ephesians chapter 2 is really um, what your position is as a believer, who you are in the kingdom of God and, and how we see ourselves often pales in comparison to the way that God sees us. I want to just say that right now. The way that you see yourself, the way that you see who you are as a believer, the way that you might see your your ministry or who you are, um, is, it pales in comparison to the way that God sees you. And the, the, and the problem with that paling in comparison is we cut ourselves short of the promises that we could inherit in Christ if we really understood what our position was. The, the, the only way that I can illustrate this is to tell you a story that I've told before, but it just came to my mind again, so I'm going to tell you again. When I was like uh, 19 or 20, I, I got hired at the Marriott Hotel to, uh, to be a, a driver. 
And, uh, and so I drove these, this van. I was really discouraged. I had this Class B driver's license, so I knew I had some level of skill that maybe I could get a job. I was really, really impressed with my commercial driver's license. So I was like going to every hotel. Can I be your driver? You know, no, no, no. Door slam one after the other. I walk into the last hotel down the Disneyland area, and I walk in, and I said, hey, you guys hiring? And it was like, door slam, no. And then this guy says from behind the counter, he says, hey, wait a minute, do you have your class B license? I'm like, well, yeah, man. I must, you must have just been able to tell by the way I walk, right? Because people with a class B walk in a certain way. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. And he goes, wait, 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 we need you. We need drivers. Come back, fill out an application. And so I filled out the application. I got fast-tracked into an interview right away. I met with the HR person. I felt like I did really good in my interview. And then I got a call back the next day and they said, hey, when can you start? And I went and got my medical release and I got started and I was just like pumped. I had a job and um, you made tips and it was really great. It was super fun. But the training time I was kind of nervous about. And so my boss was telling me, this is how you drive and this is how you drop people off. And this is what you say and this is what you don't say. And so he, he you know, rode shotgun with me and kind of told me how I do all that. And, you know, we've all been through that. And so you're extra nervous. You're driving like an idiot. You know, you're like, oh, you know, just because you're, you're just not feeling like you're self because there's a person there making you nervous. And so then um, you go through that first day of training and then the next day of training, it was like, hey man, I'm just going to keep an eye on you. You know, you do your thing, you know what to do. And so I was doing my thing and I, I drove way better. I felt great. I was interacting with people, but um, we had these walkie talkies and it would just be like, you know, red leader, red leader. No, I don't know. I'm just kidding. Whatever. He, he would call me on the walkie talkie and he'd be all careful. He went wide on that turn. I'm like, where are you, you know? And then it was like, signal, signal, you know? And it was just nitpicking everything I did. And this went on for like a week, man. I was just so over it. And I felt like this guy was everywhere just telling me what to do. And so um, I, I was trying to just like, yes, sir, him to death. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir, you know? And just sort of submitted to that process until it got to the point where I'm like two weeks into it going, this stinks, man. I just feel like this guy is always nitpicking everything I do. And so um, I, I, the human resource person that had interviewed me, really cool girl, she just goes, hey, how's things going? I'm like, oh, things are going great. And, and, um, and I said, you know, except for the, I said, except for the fact, and I used the guy's name, let's say his name was William. You know, I said, except for the fact that William just keeps like nagging like everything I do. And I said, but you know, he's my boss. So she goes, what? And, and she goes, he, he's your what? I go, well, he's my boss. I mean, I'm just going to work it through. She goes, he's not your boss. I go, what? And she goes, he's not your boss. She goes, William, get in here. Did you tell him you're his boss? He's like, well, I, I mean, I'm, I am the senior driver. You're not the senior driver. Just let him have it. Told him, Dude, you can't keep doing this to new hires. You know, basically he had, he had made himself my boss. I didn't know that I was, I didn't know. Two weeks, man. I'm like, dude, really? Forget you, man. I'm driving how I want to drive. <laughs> it affected my life completely during that time because I believed something that wasn't true. I, I sat under the authority of someone who didn't have authority over me. There are spiritual implications to this stuff, guys, because that is, that is Christianity 101. And, and if we got to get back to some of the, the healthy foundations of where we can build a solid life in Christ, one of the, the prime places that we can turn to is Ephesians chapter 2, because you got to know that there is a very squirrely, wily enemy, very patient, who, who wants to declare that he's your boss and wants to nitpick everything that you do and wants to get you to second guess all things, all the time. Do you follow me? And, and in that, that is what we have to be on guard against and realize who we are and whose we are in Christ. And so that's where we come to Ephesians chapter 2 in the first verse. And so here we go. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work um, now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3 says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and, and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. This is what we would call the bad news, right? And as you follow along, you have to understand the bad news before you can understand the good news. And verse 4 says this, But... 
Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. Now continue on with me. It says this, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on in verse 8. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is, for, this is not from yourselves. It is a, the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. <coughs> excuse me. Created in Christ to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Man, if you ever wanted to memorize a chunk of scripture, this would be a really good one to memorize because it is just chuck full with, with truth. All of scripture is, but this, in such a concise way, tells so much of the story. And, um, and, and this is how I would outline it. The first thing that if you're a note taker, the first thing that I would say is, as you read it with verse 1, it, it, it says um, that, that you, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. This is who you were, right? This is who you were. Key word, were. That is those that have accepted Christ. And we have to maybe stop here and understand what sins and, and transgressions are. I had to ask myself, even as I read through it again this time, we can take certain things for granted. Why would scripture say sins and transgressions? You know, and, and so in, in, in looking at the definition of those two words and maybe what the understanding would be is, the first it mentions is you were dead in your transgressions. Those are your willful acts of disobedience against God. Those are things that, it, it, it's stuff that you knew you were doing was wrong. Right? Transgressions is like, I've decided there's the line and I'm crossing it because I want to. Right? That's a transgression. And then this understanding of, of transgressions and sins, sins is the nature that we've been born into. Man, you had it against you from day one. As we've said many, many times, you don't have to teach a child how to be selfish. They'll learn it all on their own. It's hardwired into them. Mine is a very easy word that a child learns. Like, right? mine. Right? Mine. They get that concept really easily because we're born into a nature of sin. And so sin um, can, can be things that we're not even aware that we're doing, but it's against God. And, and without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, um, we, we don't become aware of those things. And so, um, so you have this idea of being um, dead in your transgressions and I, I put it in my notes. So, so your transgressions, your, your willful um, violations of God's laws and decrees. And secondly, you were dead and you were doomed, okay? Do you come for good news this morning? <laughs> you were dead and you were doomed. And I think we have to sit in that a little bit to understand the good news of the gospel is that the violation of those sins against God, whether they were willful or not willful, the only answer to that is the wrath of God. And that's what the scripture says. It, it says that we were then, therefore, um, by nature, object of God's wrath. And so, um, anyways, thanks for coming this morning. Bless you guys. And bring candy, for crying out loud. We need candy. <laughs> the next thing that I put in my outline is, this is who you were. And by the way, if you're feeling like, oh, I don't know if this is who I was, but this is who I feel like I am. You know, the conviction that God can rest upon our lives in a really quick way. The good news of the gospel is that once we understand who we are, we can become transformed into something that the Bible says is a brand new life where we can be literally made new again through the power of the Spirit. And so there's hope through salvation and through the gospel of Jesus. But then it talks, talks about who God is. Okay, this is who we are. And, 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 and the way that we get trapped to, to falling under authority that isn't God's authority is by believing lies. And so the truth about who God is, is that God has great love and he's rich in mercy. And if you reflect back on, on verse 4, it says, But God, because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. And then it goes on to say, it's by grace that you saved. So who you were is dead. Um, who God is, is he's great in his love and his mercy. Who Jesus is, is that he's the giver of life and brings us from a place of death to resurrection. 
But who you are now is what we really want to talk about this morning. And who you are now, either change, it, it will absolutely change the way that you face tests and trials in your life. It'll change the way that you, um, you look at the world around you and your role in relationships, your role in family and so forth is understanding who you are now. There's a word that, and that it says there. It says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. How many of you have ever just taken time to really consider what that might even mean? There's all kinds of teaching that can go around this and maybe some of it you get a little nervous when we come near this because there's um, extreme doctrines that would basically say, hey, you're seated in realms and so just tell God what you want and he has to do it if you just claim it, right? Some of you have been, um, maybe you believe that now or you've been a part of what was called like a name it and claim it kind of thing, right? Name it like you want a sweet car, name it, you know, and keep naming it over and if you really claim it, then it, that car will be yours because that's what God wants to do. Is that too awkward to say right now? Okay. So I think similar to, to, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I think that's what we've done is say, ooh, I don't want to be one of those name it and claim it people. So I don't want to understand what my role is seated in heavenly realms. You see, um, well, let, let's just go on and, and hopefully this will make sense because the idea of being seated refers to a place of authority. We know that who Jesus is, is he's, he is seated on high, that, that he is the name above all names. He is the one who has all authority. That's why when we get to talking about the name of Jesus, it's like, wow, right? That there's this idea of power and breakthrough because his name has authority. When you have the, the idea of seated, it's imagery of where, where a king is on the throne, right? And a king rules from a throne and speaks forth what the command is and the subjects do what the king says. Follow me? Seated is, is a response to where Jesus is. It doesn't say that Jesus is pacing in heaven. It doesn't say that he is, um, you know, kind of scratching his head. It doesn't say that he has his hands in his face. It says that he is seated in heavenly places. And then it says that you, as his sons and daughters, that you as the children of God, are seated with him. That should make an impact in our lives if we really believe that's true. That if I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, then who I am in Christ has consequence. Who I am in Christ has authority. Who I am in Christ makes a difference when I walk in the room. It's not out of pride. It's not out of arrogance. It's not out of the t-shirt I wear, the bumper sticker on my car. It's a reality that I'm seated with Christ. It speaks of stability. It speaks of settledness. It speaks of authority. Let me, let me try to explain it this way, that um, you right now are literally seated in a pew, right? You're literally seated in a pew, but you're figuratively seated somewhere else. Like you're figuratively seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I heard one pastor say it so well, and he used the analogy of marriage to, to help understand what that might mean. And so, um, so when somebody becomes married, they are, so you're, you're literally seated here, but you're legally seated with Christ, right? So literal here, legally there. Legally in a marriage relationship, you come together, the two become one flesh, but also your stuff becomes one, correct? That you have now the authority to speak on the other's behalf. So in other words, in a medical situation, who are you? Are you the wife? Okay, so now you can be the one that I talk to. It has, a, it has an implication. When Rochelle and I got married, man, she really scored because I had like 500 bucks in the bank. I had an Isuzu Trooper and I had like a 12-foot aluminum boat. It was my little fishing boat. She got all that, right? <laughs> all hers. And it was good for her. She loved it. Sweet. So we're not literally seated in heaven. I don't want to paint the picture that, 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 you know, that that's where we are. But I do, want to, I do want to drive home the reality of the point that we are legally, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness functions in legality, right? The enemy is a legalist. He's looking for ways to take authority. Just like my fake boss was looking for ways to take authority over me, the enemy is looking for ways to take authority over you. And the only way he can do it is when he lies to you. And when these kind of truths are not exposed and when we see ourselves as less than who we truly are in Christ. And, and so um, let's, let's kind of continue on with this because if we really understand this stuff, if we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, that means that his victory is your victory, right? Jesus' victory, his resurrection is your resurrection. That you were raised with him in Christ. 
that, that his perspective is your perspective. That where if you are seated with Jesus in heavenly places, the way that you pray is different, the way that you see the world is different, because your perspective is different, knowing that you're not, you're not like pacing around with Jesus, you're seated with him in those heavenly places. And third, his authority is your authority. I think that's the one that really, really makes a difference. Um, let's get some context and, and go up to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. Paul, in the writing of this letter to the church in Ephesus, is we're really wanting to drive this point home about who they are. And, and as you know, the book of Ephesians speaks of spiritual warfare and fighting the good fight of faith and how we do it. But he begins in the very beginning by setting it up saying, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. He's like, you've got to have your eyes open to be able to see it. And that comes through the power of the Spirit and it comes through the, the truth being proclaimed over your life and going, oh wait, I don't have to submit to a yoke of slavery. I don't have to submit to my fake boss anymore. I'm free of that. Let me tell you, my job at the Marriott was way better after I stopped submitting. I kind of took it the other direction. I'm like, no, you will submit to me, fool. No, I'm just kidding. I, I never did. I'm just joking. I'm kidding. Um, in, in verse... Uh, as we read on in verse 19, and it says, And his comparable great power for us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realms, far above the all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the age to come. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And you're seated with him. And his victory is your victory. And his perspective is your victory. And his authority is your authority. And guess what? Now we just got to act like it. And when we begin to act like it and walk in that true authority, it changes things. Um, let's, let's talk about a practical way. And this is really what I, I hope to leave you with. Um, one of the things that has become more and more apparent to me, uh, and, and I've heard this my whole life, but it's the power of our words, right? And when I was studying that in Acts, it just really opened my eyes that when Philip spoke things, and he just didn't speak about things, but when he spoke as seated in heavenly places, when he came to a place called Samaria, when he spoke, it changed things. And, and we know so much about words, and I'm going to give you some scripture that you've probably heard about before, but one of the practical implications of the authority that we carry is what comes out of our mouth, that the power of our words could literally change things. This isn't, again, um, positive confession or, or don't put a jinx on it kind of like weird voodoo. This is the Word of God. And the, and the Word of God says some things here. Let, let me give you some examples. Proverbs 10, verse 11. There's a, t a ton of Proverbs about your words. Um, it says, Proverbs 10 verse 11, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. Right? Think about that for a second. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The mouth of the righteous is called to speak life. It should bubble out of us. That we should be speaking life to our spouse, life to our children, life to situations and circumstances. But you see the, the, the violent or the one that, that is contrasted to the, the righteous person they, they, or the wicked, they speak um, violence out of their mouth. They, they're in the defensive posture or an offensive posture, excuse me. Um, Proverbs 12, reckless words pierce like a sword. How many of you go, yup? <laughs> we've been on the receiving end of, of reckless words and chances are we've been on the giving end of reckless words, right? Reckless words, many times, the most harmful and hurtful things aren't premeditated. It's not like you want to sit there and think about it, but they're dwelling inside of you. As Jesus said, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And when pressed and squeezed, stupid stuff comes out of our mouth. And once it gets out, it pierces like a sword. But the opposite of that is the tongue of the wise brings healing. What a great privilege that we have to either be on the side of recklessness or on the side of wisdom. Proverbs 18, 21. This is probably one that you'll identify with and have heard many times. It says, The tongue has the power of life and death. Do you believe that? 
The tongue has the power of life and death. If you just take a step back for a moment and look from the very beginning of Scripture, right in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 3, the, the, it reads this, And God said, right? And God said, and God spoke life, God spoke creation. Things happen as words came out of God's mouth. Adam had the opportunity to name animals, and Adam said, you will be called such and such. And that, that, that animal was called such and such according to what God looked and said, okay, what are you going to name him, Adam? And Adam said it, and God's like, yep, that's the giraffe now. Words from the very beginning have been powerful. And so, so words have creative power. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I like the way that the New Living Translation put it, because I think it breaks it down in a way that we might understand it a little better. It says the tongue can bring um, death or life, and those who love to talk will reap the consequences. The tongue can bring life and death, and those who love to talk... They're going to reap the consequences. Speak life, right? James um, says it so, so well, man. James 3, 5. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest fire is set on, on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And it... it and is itself set on fire by hell. Hell, right? See, I enunciated that. <laughs> this tongue, again, we've experienced this like, oh, why did I say that? Words and the power of it. Words, I, I, I narrowed down three things that I, I see in Scripture about words. Um, words have creative power, as I said from the very beginning of the book, and God said, let there be. Your words have creative power. Your words have the power of life, or they have the power of death. They have the, they have the power to create, or they have the power to destroy. I, I don't want to be taken literally here to say, well, I can say, you know, this happened, and, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, flower form out of the ground. That's not the weirdness I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what we speak over one another. The things that a father speaks over a son, the things that a husband speaks over a wife, the things that, that a friend says to another friend, that those things are charting a course for our life that are either leading towards victory, leading towards health and, and, and authority in Christ, like leading towards the things of the kingdom, or they're leading towards developing more insecurity, developing fears, developing anxiety, Developing second guessing about personality and oh I'm such an idiot and I do these things and, and so forth and it leads to something. It leads to a very dangerous, dangerous cycle of agreeing with what the enemy says about you versus agreeing with what God says about you. Words have authoritative power, right? So words have creative power. Words have authoritative power. Um, that's why in scripture it says, hey, uh, uh, by the witness of two or three, a matter shall be established. It's, it's these, what is spoken about a situation has actual real power. Um, Jesus, you might remember when he was with his boys and they were on the, the Sea of Galilee and a storm rises up and he's sleeping and they're freaking out. And what does Jesus do? He wakes up and they're, and, and they're like, how could you be sleeping right now? And Jesus says what? Peace. Be still. His words had authority even over creation. And then what do they do? They're like, man, who, who is this one? That even the winds obey him. Words have overcoming power, right? What do we know? We often love to quote it. That, that how do we overcome the enemy? By the blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony, right? I thought that was going to hit big. I thought I threw a soft pitch and you guys are like, well, I don't know. What do we say? Right? The re revelation says it. Like, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That these words have power. So what, what I put over each one of if words have creative power, then we as God's people speak life. Right? If words have creative power, then we speak life. That we are, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That we should be seeing things through victorious eyes and speaking things through Christ-like perspective. And with Christ's authority. And so, if words have creative power, we speak life. If words have authorita authoritative power, we speak up. We speak up. 
authoritative power. And, and please, um, don't mistake what I'm saying as if to say that we're only allowed to say things that make people feel good. Right? We're supposed to say the most loving, truthful thing. And we say it in such a way as if we really cared about that person, not if we wanted to let them have it and feel good about ourselves for what we know. We say the most loving and the truthful thing, so we speak up. Oh man, I, I, am I back to my Marriott analogy. I'm super grateful that the HR person spoke up for me. Changed everything. That her authority in that moment, just by saying, no, he's not. That's not your boss. In a moment, I'm like, well, that's not my boss. All that's done. So speak up. Words have overcoming power, so speak truth, right? Speak truth. Not your truth. Speak the truth, right? Truth is not um, some subjective thing that w according to what I think about a situation or my perspective, but you speak truth as it's occurred in your life. You speak truth of God's word. You speak forth truth that has an overcoming power. I just have a few moments left and, and this is really, if you haven't listened to anything I said, I'm not offended at all. But if you listen, don't listen to this, I'm going to be super offended because this is really important, right? So take a deep breath. The restaurant will be there. Like your lunch is coming. Everything's good. It's all good. This might just change your life. And I'm not joking. This might just change your life. I mentioned earlier that, that if we're not careful with all the words that are being thrown around and things that have been spoken over your life and things that have been spoken over my life, that they can create very unhealthy patterns. And those unhealthy patterns are, are things that we don't even know that we've done, but we've agreed with the enemy about something. Right? In other, in other words, it, look, it looks like this. That, that maybe something was spoken over your life powerfully. You know, maybe it was by a parent. Maybe it was by a friend. Maybe it was by just some stranger. And, and they said something to you like, man, you're lazy. You'll never amount to anything. And you go, it just like, you just took it. And then when something doesn't go right, what comes back up in your mind? It's like, man, I am lazy. I'm never going to amount to anything. You see, who do you think planted that thought in your mind? Was it Jesus seated in heavenly places giving you a perspective? If it wasn't Jesus, there really is only one other choice, right? It was the enemy who, th who sought to perpetuate a lie in your life that you could hang on to. And, and I'm not being overly dramatic. You can literally hang on to these lies for year after year after year. And 20 years later, you're still believing the same garbage that was given to you by a messenger of the enemy. And I'm telling you, that person maybe didn't even know they were being used in that way. But when we agree with something that the enemy is trying to perpetuate as a lie into our life, it is an agreement with the enemy. And he begins to get a foothold in our life. I, I, I wrote down this, that I believe this to be true, that the enemy is a hunter, right? He's a hunter. He, he even, not you hunter, but the enemy hunts, that he, he prowls, right? And he's looking for one to devour. And we know that those who hunt are opportunistic. They're looking for the opportunity to exploit whatever they hunt in that moment of weakness. And so, in certain moments of weaknesses, um, you may have heard this lie over your life. Things like, I mess everything up. I mess everything up. I'm incapable of a real relationship or a friendship. I'm just an angry person. I'm just who I am. I'm, I'm whatever nationality you choose to associate that anger with, you know, and we just say, oh, I'm such and such, so I'm an angry person. Or, I'm such and such, so I, I have a, a temper. Because you've believed that and you've, you've rehearsed that and someone's reinforced that and now all of a sudden it becomes an agreement. I'm just lazy. Um, I'm just an idiot. I just do stupid stuff all the time. I'm such an idiot. I'm so dumb. You know, those things become like, we, we think it's almost like self-deprecating, you know, like just makes us like a little more socially acceptable. Oh, how, no, you're really not. Like as if we're fishing, you know. You're not an idiot. You're super smart. Stop that. Right? It's bigger, guys. It's bigger because those things get rehearsed in our mind. They're playing around in there. And every time we, we, we go to that point where we failed at something, we believe a lie about our character. We believe a lie about who we are in Christ. That is not language for those who are seated in heavenly places. That is not language for those who have been transformed and being made new into the image of Christ. That is who you were. That is not who you are. 
These agreements often happen um, when things go wrong in our lives. And when things go wrong in our lives, we begin to, to try to figure out why they are. And we, if we blame ourselves or we blame our character, we blame our choice, whatever else, we begin to believe something. And that, that assumption about ourselves leads to a certain behavior about ourselves too. So if you, if you believe it in your heart, you begin to act out in that same way. Um, I, I, I identified one in my life. I, I was wondering what it was, you know, that so many times when something was going really, really well, right? Like a moment to celebrate. In a moment to celebrate, I would just be like, eh. Totally ruining the opportunity to just go, yeah, victory. Why was I doing that? Because I had an agreement that don't celebrate because right around the corner comes tragedy. See, I'm just giving you an example. And, and, and I had to identify that. And that was something fairly recently in my life that I was like, oh my, I, I talked to somebody about it. I said, why do you think that is? You know, and you begin to peel the onion and you realize whatever the experience was that, that causes that. So I'm telling you that not for you to feel bad for me, okay? I'm not telling you that for you to go, oh man, that stinks. Or for you to come up to me and say, hey, don't forget to celebrate, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you that so that you understand this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. And, and, and I, don't, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want that agreement in my life. And there are many others. There are many others. There are things that I'm watching that when I say that. You know, I'm being careful. And I would encourage you along the same way. Because see, what happens with these agreements is they're not just like silly little words that we say. They literally change the way that we behave. They literally change the actions. And, and, and I wrote this down. Assumptions about who you are become agreements that shape outcomes, right? Assumptions about who you are become agreements. So negative assumptions, they become an agreement. Yep, that's me. I always mess it up. I always do the dumb thing. I'm socially awkward. I'm da da da, da. And those agreements shape outcomes. And here's the good news. These things can be broken. These things can 100% be broken. Um, uh, I want to invite our, our worship team to come because we literally have two minutes left. So you just have to do it, man. You just have to get them up here. <laughs> Run up here, guys. No, I'm joking. I, I, I think that... I, I, I think I've experienced some life enough to see some cycles, Right? And to see some cycles of, of destruction that the enemy has when the people of God submit to the wrong boss and don't even know it. I've seen these types of agreements with the wrong authority in our life break up marriages. I've seen them literally steal joy away from people. I've seen them... Um, rob opportunities for people to be used by God and for his purposes. And I've literally seen these kinds of things cause people to move away from relationship with God, period. And, and that's why I come to you in the way that I do. And that's why I, I said that. Like, if you don't hear anything, hear this part. Because I, I came into the, today's service thinking, why not today that God would break off some of those wrong agreements in our lives? And, 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 and simply... By coming into the presence of God and declaring who God is, um, we had a great speaker come to our, our, our men's breakfast, Pete Shembrook. And Pete said something, I think it ident we identified all of us. He said, you've got to rebuke things and replace things. You've got to repent and replace. Maybe I added rebuke, but whatever. Um, that we repent of some of these things. We, we, we turn away and go, and God, I, I, I'm no longer going to submit to the wrong authority. But you don't just hang out there. You replace it with truth and who you are going to be seated with and how you are going to conduct yourself as a result. And so I wanted to do this. I wanted to invite you to stand with me. And, and we sing a song that... I think declares the character and nature of God so well. Uh, and the song is God with us, God for us. No one can stand between us. Um, there's so much in that song. And, and as you're, you're singing it, would you fill your heart with truth about who God is? And that truth, what that does is it replaces the lie of what you might have believed. And it pushes the enemy out. And then we're just going to take a moment together as a church just to break things over our lives. Just say no more. Like today's the day that we stand in authority against agreements that we may have subconsciously made. Maybe we overtly said, I'm never going to do such and such or whatever. We're just going to break it in the name of Jesus and walk in the, the freedom that God's given us as sons and daughters. Does it sound okay with you? All right. Well, let's sing this song together and let's fill our hearts with truth of his character.
steadfast, never failing, you are faithful. All creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you've done.
just do this in the, in the presence of God? Maybe you've identified with some of the things that I've spoken today and, and you've realized that knowingly or unknowingly you've agreed with lies about who you are. And it would be wrong to not give you the opportunity to break that agreement that's been made with the enemy and replace it with truth about who you are as a believer in Jesus, that you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And the way that it looks is this, is just to take a moment and, and say, God, is, is there anything? And let him bring something to mind. I've given you some suggestions or some things that are often common in, in the way that the enemy seeks to destroy our destiny by speaking things over our life that, that confines us to those words confining us to things like you'll never amount to anything or people in your family don't ever do such and such or using your last name to say oh the so-and-sos are always bad at such and such you know these things that come off almost tongue-in-cheek or jokey can really affect your destiny and let the Holy Spirit illuminate that for a moment that there's no limitations to what the Spirit of God can do we are naturally limited but we're not called to limit ourselves. We want to let God work through us. And that's why these, breaking these agreements is so important. So whatever that is, just take a moment and, and just think about that. Let the Holy Spirit bring some clarity to you. And as it comes to mind, it's just a real simple prayer that we pray but the simple prayer is packed with authority because remember who you are. You're not just speaking things you hope to be true, but you're speaking on behalf of Jesus. You're speaking with authority. His victory is your victory. His perspective is your perspective. And his authority is your authority. And with that authority, I invite you to speak the simple truth. I renounce any agreement I've made with the enemy. If you want to say it out loud, say it out loud. If you want to whisper it, just whisper it, but just say it. Get the words out. I renounce any agreement I've made with the enemy by believing or speaking a lie about myself or believing a lie that others have spoken about me. I renounce that agreement in the name of Jesus. And remember, we renounce things and, 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 then, and, and then we repent of it and we walk and we turn the other way, but we have to replace. And, and here's the truth that I, I want to replace that lie with. And, it, and it's truth directly from God's word. I would invite you to open your eyes and look to the screen. And on the screen, you're going to see Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And I'm going to read it first and then we're going to say it together with one voice. But let me read it first. It says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, it's significant to speak it out, okay? And we're going to give a shot at it as we look at this, this together. And so if you could put chapter 6, or excuse me, verse 6 back up on the screen. Would you say this out loud with me and, and, and make it a declaration of, your, of, of truth over your life? Say this with me. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And now before we, we stop this, let's look at the 10th verse because this is what I want to leave you with. This is who you are. You're God's handiwork. You're created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God's prepared in advance for you to do and, and I want to declare that uh, you're his workmanship he's making something beautiful out of you don't believe the lie come on let's say it for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do his good works which God prepared in advance for us to do would you just put out your hands 
Father, I bless your people today. God, I bless them with your truth. I think highly of them, but Lord, you think so much more highly. You think from a perfect heavenly perspective. Father, I bless them with truth today. Lord, may they walk out of this place free of agreements with the enemy that they didn't even know they made. May they walk out of this place free to, wa to walk as you've called them to walk, seated in heavenly places. Kind of funny to say walk and seated, but you know what I'm after. God, I bless them now in the name of Jesus. Lord, may they walk out of here free in the authority of you. Bless them now in your precious name. In Jesus' name, I bless you. Amen and amen. God bless you.